Hi, it's uh, wonderful to be here at this extraordinary gathering. Oh, slight wardrobe change, excuse me. On the morning of the day that Roger Payne, on the morning of the day that Roger Payne was going to leave this world, I lay on the daybed in my office staring up at the ceiling, trying to decide what to do with the advice I'd been given the day before. The advice was, don't call Roger. The day before, a mutual friend had phoned to say, I'm calling you about Roger. I don't know if anyone told you, but Roger is going to die tomorrow. I'd asked whether it would be a good or bad idea to phone him. As I said, the answer I got was, don't call him. So I was lying there wondering if I should contradict the advice. Would it be a right or wrong thing? Would I be intruding? And then I realized that Roger would decide the matter very simply. He'd either pick up or he wouldn't. So I called his cell. To my great surprise, someone picked up on the first ring. It was one of Roger's sons, Sam, I think. The pickup was so unexpected that I didn't quite catch who. I said, I know this is the worst possible timing. I just called to say hello, thank you, and goodbye. Dad, he said, it's Carl Safina. Oh, Carl, I heard Roger reply. Give me the phone. Roger spoke to me for 11 remarkable minutes. He wasn't interested in talking about himself or dwelling with me about his situation. No, hours from death, he asked what I was up to. Imagine, I probably sputtered on about a few writing projects in the works and a book I'd called him about last spring, about an orphaned owl that my wife and I had raised and rewilded. Roger had studied the hearing of barn owls before his famous whale work, and a few months ago when I was finalizing my owl book, I'd phoned him with a question related to owl hearing. I'd just read one of his old scientific publications, and I asked him if he might clarify a statement about owl sound perception. We had a pleasant sciency chat and did a bit of catching up. Now, on this last day in the world, Roger asked me when my book was coming out. October 3rd, I told him. I'm sorry I won't be around to read it, he said with almost a chuckle. I was astonished that right at the very end of his voyage, Roger's hand was so firmly on the tiller that he remained interested in what others were up to, that he could be so fully voiced and cheerful. Truly, he was the captain of his life and of his fate, an exemplary life, quite literally, to the very end. On Roger's last day, I was still learning from him about how to be alive. We were having such a good conversation, in fact, that Lisa had to take the phone to very gently remind both of us that there were some other people who just arrived who needed to talk to Roger. And so we said farewell, and Roger focused his attention on his in-person audience. And later that day, Roger Payne, how do you speak of the passing of someone whose influence is everywhere, who forever changed the ocean and our minds? It's less that Roger has passed than that the world is still catching up to him. Maybe he's even waiting for us with a sort of kindly bemusement that we are so slow to fully comprehend him as we're all here trying our best to do today. That is not to suggest that the world did not quickly grasp Roger's biggest message. Indeed, it did. We have. To fully understand Roger's world-changing whale work, we need to consider the world of whale whales and our view of the ocean before Roger Payne and after. The inflection point, of course, was in two parts. The first, Scott and Helen McVeigh and Roger's realization that humpback whales sing and the second, their decisively strategic sharing of that discovery in the highest profile outlets of the time, Science Magazine and National Geographic, whose worldwide subscribers numbered in the double digit millions. If something was in Nat Geo, everyone soon knew it, and soon, everyone did. 
Roger devoted the rest of his life to the implications of that discovery, but let's go to just before it happened to see how immense was the change it wrought. The fact that a whale might sing was entirely unknown to humans until the 1950s. U.S. military people who'd begun listening for Russian submarines eventually realized that strange sounds they were hearing were coming from whales. Word got to Scott McVie and, and to Roger. Studying the recordings and their visual representations, the McVeighs and Roger realized that the vocalizations were patterned. The whales were singing. When Payne and McVeigh published Songs of Humpback Whales in Science in 1971, the journal's cover featured an image of the structure of a whale song. The first sentence was, humpback whales produce a series of beautiful and varied sounds for a period of seven to 30 minutes and then repeat the same series with considerable precision the function of the songs is unknown. Katie Payne, Chris Clark, Hal Whitehead, Paul Winter, Shane Giro, and others has helped have helped teach us that planet Earth constantly thrums with messages being sent and received by living things. Life is vibrant and it generates good vibrations throughout the air and the ground and the sea. But whale sounds seem particularly enchanted. Roger described the first time he heard a humpback whale singing with these words. Normally you don't hear the sighs of the ocean, but I heard it that night. That's what whales do. They give the voice of the ocean, and the voice they give, they give is ethereal and unearthly. Roger told me, the reaction of some people to hearing whales sing is to burst into tears. I've seen that a lot. Not only was Roger's life changed by the songs, his recordings let whales change humanity. Male humpback whales sing strange and haunting melodies, and that is a cultural phenomenon. All adult males in each ocean sing the same song, that differs from ocean to ocean, but each year the song of each ocean changes. The new songs spread wave-like, crossing blue infinities whale to whale, all the whales adopting the same changed elements of the song. How it will change, humans cannot predict. When songs of Hawaiian and Mexican humpbacks change simultaneously and identically, despite a separation spanning 4,800 kilometers of ocean, Researcher Ellen Garland and colleagues wrote that this phenomenon is, quote, unparalleled in any other non-human animals, culture change at a vast scale. A male humpback will usually complete the song, then repeat it numerous times, singing for hours on end. Roger, always so deeply perceptive, told me, the songs of humpback whales employ rhyme, and why not? Humans have been using rhyme at least since Homer and probably long before. It's a way of remembering. Roger told me that when the song appears to reach its end, singing humpback whales usually breathe. But if they breathe mid-song, they don't interrupt their singing. He said, quote, they tuck their breath in and let the song continue to flow. Roger spearheaded the commercially produced 1970 vinyl record of humpback songs that became an instant sensation. A recorded insert that was included in every copy of National Geographic remains the largest single printing of any sound recording in the history of the world. The first thing the recordings did was to save the whales from total annihilation. Propelled largely by the beauty humans perceived in these recordings, the movement to save the whales hit full stride. Whales went for, from being thought of, if they were thought of at all, as floating masses of mindless blubber in the 1960s to spiritual icons of the 1970s ground-swelling environmental movement. So deeply did the whales' music move us that a recording of humpback whale song is among the few sounds included in the Voyager spacecraft. Humanity's calling card to the galaxy has taken humpback song beyond our solar system. It's a message in a bottle, hoping, perhaps, 
that an alien life form of great and cultured intellect can understand. But the whale's message is simple, and even we earthlings should be smart enough to understand it. They're saying, in effect, we the living celebrate being alive. The song culture of humpback whales changed our culture, and why? Simply this. With Roger Payne's guidance, we briefly directed our attention to something beautiful on Earth. For a moment, we listened. The whales continue calling us, asking, in effect, can you hear me now? Within a few years of those recordings going public, whale hunting was largely ended, but not without a fight. After petroleum became civilization's major fuel and lubricant, nobody ever again needed to kill whales for light or oil. But as whale products were needed less and less, whales were killed more and more. By the 1940s, men were killing whales to use them in products such as nitroglycerin and margarine, of all things. Into the space age, whales became ingredients in dog food and cat food, in mink food on fur farms, and fertilizer, products that could all have been made with lesser torments. Petroleum-fueled ships hunting with cannon-fired explosives had the speed and killing ability to pursue the swifter whales than men pulling on oars in the 1800s could never catch. Mechanization meant men could reduce a wild whale to vats of oil and processed parts in an hour. 10 regional whale populations of five species were either totally extirpated or so demolished that little or no recovery is evident today, including right whales in the North Atlantic here, bowheads in the Eastern Arctic, blue whales in the Sub-Antarctic, and others. For all whales everywhere, the 20th century tallied approximately three million killed. Official whale kill records are always under estimates because whalers systematically lie. After World War II from 1947 to 1973, Soviet whalers reported killing 2,700 humpback whales in the Southern Hemisphere. They actually killed 49,000. They reported fewer than one out of every 20 killed. They killed 3,200 Southern right whales and reported four. Back in 1969, from the deck of a whale hunting ship already scheduled to cease operations due to self-inflicted scarcity, Peter Matheson had written, blue whales, right whales, and humpbacks are disappearing from the seas, and to kill them is forbidden. It is also forbidden to kill finbacks north of 40 degrees south latitude, but both laws, the local whalers say, are ignored. They faced a fine, but a dead whale was worth about 10 times the amount of the fine. The whale's muscle could be used for chicken and pig feed. The blood, guts, and bone would become fertilizer. Sperm whales, particularly, would yield motor oil additive, ivory teeth, and the salt creatine for flavoring manufactured soups. Nothing is wasted, Peter wrote, but the whale itself. Roger Payne said, it's as if an intelligent aliens, it's, it's as if intelligent aliens had arrived from outer space and because we couldn't understand their language, we cooked and ate them. Hal Whitehead has written, when you compare relative brain size, levels of self-awareness, sociality, or the importance of culture, cetaceans come out between apes and humans. They fit the philosophical definition of personhood. The word whale is just a label, just a sound we make. It covers a gap where the living world confronts the faulty work in progress known as human empathy. In truth, there can be no word large enough to fit these creatures. Needing no reference to human beings or human language, they live their existences in the completeness of themselves, distant from continents and far beyond our words carrying on life in the fond company of family and comrades. That was true long before any first human lifted their knuckles from the dust, and it remains true this minute. To destroy a whale is a monumental denial of life and merely one symptom of the human species' modern working hatred for the world. 
We have even had the tone deafness to name one whale killer, but that shoe best fits the species who possesses feet to wear it. In 1972, just two years after Payne and McVeigh's paper in Science and distribution of the recordings in National Geographic, the United Nations called for a cessation of whale hunting. The United States' brand new Marine Mammal Protection Act shuttered the last U.S. whaling station. And at the meeting of the International Whaling Commission, the United States introduced the first formal proposal for a global whale hunting moratorium which was rejected. The Soviets and Japanese voted themselves increased kill quotas. Meanwhile, some countries that had quit whaling began to advocate restraint. Unfamiliar with restraint, in 1977, the Whaling Commission voted to increase their sperm whale quota. Commission scientists had recommended a kill of 763 North Pacific sperm whales, but the commissioners set the kill at 6,444, more than eight times as high. Yet Rogers' message was still rippling and reverberating and a new generation of activists was amplifying it. In 1979, the Whaling Commission finally summoned the votes for a moratorium on most whale hunting. This vote was such a turnaround that it stunned even the most ardent whale protectionists. A month later, the Soviets said they wanted to kill 1,508 sperm whales. Denied permission, that year they reported killing an accurate sounding 201, but who knows how many they really killed. Yet the extinction trajectory continued igniting, intensifying international opposition. The tide had turned. In 1982, the commission passed a resolution that by 1986, the quota for all species would be zero for a decade. Most countries that were still killing whales soon quit for good. What Peter Matheson had seen back in the 1960s had made him pessimistic about the whale's prospects. He'd written, the remnant bands of the great whales are destroyed whenever and wherever encountered, and doubtless the lesser whales will hold out long enough to make it certain that the last of the leviathans will be exterminated along the way. Already the blue whale is practically extinct, and the right whales and the humpbacks are close behind. What Peter had not foreseen in the 1960s was that Roger Payne would pivotally help save the whales from us, and so, we still have whales. And today, whales are more appreciated than ever. And for what it's worth, whale watching yields more lucre than killing. Whales are doing much better in many places. I often see humpbacks, fin, and minkies when I'm out fishing. I even see humpbacks from shore almost every time I'm out with our dogs walking Long Island's ocean beaches. Along the west coast in Hawaii, and in the Antarctic, the recovery of whales is easily evident. But whales continue to suffer in an ocean of plastics, chemicals, fishing tangles, spinning propellers, speeding hulls, and noise. The more humans fill the world, the more we empty it. Roger Payne, at a crucial time and in an incisive way, helped save the whales for themselves and for us. Roger has left us to answer the next question. Who now will save us? Thank you. <laughs>